Hello there, my name's Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. Let me first apologise for the background electronic interference which I've tried to edit out as best I can. Unfortunately, these things are not apparent at the time until the recording is played back through the speakers, but hopefully the message still comes across. You don't have to have any sort of involvement in either angling or commercial fishing to know that some coastal fish stocks appear to be in crisis. Statistics clearly show that despite all the advances in modern technology, it now takes 17 times more commercial effort to match the results obtained when the first otter trawl was introduced. The answer to the question, why have our fish stocks become so depleted, can be both easy and difficult to answer. Easy in the sense that it is clearly down to overfishing, but difficult in understanding why, when armed with reams of hard scientific data from fishery scientists, governments across Europe prefer to bury their heads in the sand due to a mix of commercial lobbying and live-for-today mentality. All EU member states employ fisheries scientists to assess and to advise. What fisheries ministers do with the data provided is ultimately down to them. So to get a feel for where and how this information is generated, I'm in the company of Chris Borgie, who works on board the Scottish Sea Fishery Research Vessel, Scotia. For people like me interested in fishing, working aboard a huge, comfortable, purpose-built vessel with such a wide range of scientific capability would be the dream job. So explain to us your background, your fishery interests and your role aboard the boat. I came to Fleetwood in 1969 to join the deep sea fishing industry and uh, I served on multiple vessels working all sorts of grounds from the west coast of Africa, Spitsbergen, Bear Island, Greenland, Iceland over the years doing multiple fishing operations mainly my particular expertise is pelagic trawling, pelagic fisheries but I have done a lot of demersal activity both single boating and pair trolling. Just about the only things that I haven't done is potting and, and netting. Because of the the way that the fishing industry works, you're paid on profits and the high cost of fuel and associated transport and the cost of boxes, ice and everything else, it became basically unviable for me to carry on being a commercial fish. So because I was still had a few years left, I thought that I'd try another direction. And somebody told me about the role in the Scotia. And when I approached the agents who were managing then at the time, Mars, they knew of me. And I had no problem getting a job on the Scotia. Currently, my role is deck boss, in charge of a team of four, doing multiple operations. Although the vessel is a fishery research vessel, she's also a multi-purpose. A lot of the work that we do is into global warming. We go out into the North Atlantic current and we measure the strength of the North Atlantic current and the salinity in the deeper waters, which tells you how fast the ice pack is melting. We also do 3D seabed mapping for places like wind farms. We also go out right onto the edge of the continental shelf. The deepest we have fish is down to 2100 metres, which is just about on the very maximum of the amount of walk that we carry, because we can only carry 4,000 metres of walk. But because the gear is very heavy, that you need to get down the seabed and the trawls are specially designed to go down to that depth, the, the floats and everything are designed to go down there. And we have found new species, new species of worms, shells, species of fish. And we specifically do the deep water because of the long lifespan of deep water species. Some of the species don't mature for 20 years. so. We're looking at the conservation of the deep water species, but there's not that many ships that fish that deep because of the, the high costs involved. And a lot of the work you do, it's on very steep edges. 
So one side of the gear might be in 1800 metres and the other side will be in 2000 metres. And it takes a particular skill to talk along the deep edges. Just the, the time involved, you'll be an hour sending the gear down to the bottom, at the quarter of an hour for it to settle, another hour towing it, and then another hour to recover it. So it's a three hour operation just to do a one hour tow. We also go out taking mackerel leg and herring egg surveys. We were the first ship to find that the mackerel eggs. We ended up 300 miles west of Rockall. You do uh, transient lines, you know about these transient lines, you run a, a straight line and then north and south 15, 30 miles and then back in again on another easterly line. Well, we ended up 300 miles west of Rocco, which is 240 miles off the land anyway, and we were still finding mackerel eggs and they'd never found them out there before. So now that they're thinking that maybe the mackerel are going further and further west all the time. I know when I was commercial fishing out of Fraserburgh, doing the twin rigging for the prawns, you get a lot of red mullet now. Do you never ever used to get them? They're only small and commercially it's not viable to land them into Fraserburgh because you don't get the price for them that you get in the south, but there is quite a lot of them there. We go off Western Ireland when you do the IBT, US International Bottom Troll Quantitative Surveys. When we're working off Western Ireland, we find that there's certain times of day there's a lot of boar fish, which the Irish government are looking into harvesting for meal. And you get 10 tons of boar fish for half an hour, which is a good old considering you're only towing half an hour. The trolls that we work are not fully commercial trolls, they're scientific trolls, they're not as big and as powerful and the only troll that we work really that is a commercial design is the monk troll and the deep water which is the same troll as the deep water troll. What we do for a scientific basis that you don't do commercially is you attach spare pairs of cut ends at the back of the rock hoppers, you know, which roll on the seabed. And they've found that they're catching as much fish that's actually going underneath the net that's going down it. So the, that's a thing that they're looking to transfer to the commercial expertise. My speciality is pelagic because I did years and years of it for mackerel, herring, sardine, poachers, sardine others off the west coast of Africa. So my expertise is more in the pelagic and we do stock surveys for mackerel. But it's very rare that you shoot the mackerel troll actually because it's mainly an acoustic survey. You'll run a line and take readings off the sounders because the scientific sounders they can tell you the actual size of the fish and we'll maybe once a day have a tour just to see what the stock is like. But they don't really want to catch a large amount of fish because it's only going to be dumped again. So they're only wanting a small sample. But the thing with pelagic fishing is that sometimes you can just hit the pelagic mark and there's nothing basically you can do about it. It's 2014 now and this summer, up and down the country, anglers are going mad about the sudden shortage of mackerel, primarily along the south and west facing coast of England. But is there really an actual stock density shortfall or just a redistribution of existing numbers driven elsewhere by as yet unidentified environmental factors? No, there's plenty of mackerel around. See, the things that we do is that when you're doing the mackerel service, you run transient lines. So if the lines are 15 miles apart, there might be, you can see commercial vessels seven miles maybe to the north of you, but you can't go to them. They just run the transient line and that's it. On the radio, you can hear the pelagic men saying how much they've got, but you don't come off the line, you stick to the line. And these lines are altered every year. They've moved them, say, five or 10 miles north. So it might take 10 years to do all the little areas that they want to do. We specifically target all the way around the Shetlands mainly, both East and West Shetlands and Hockneys for mackerel and then we go off 
will sting to outside of the Hebrides and then work in and out out to Rosemary Bank, Atten Bank, in and out transient lines for three weeks. We generally finish off somewhere south out of Killybex. When you do the RBTQS ones, because you only do them in daylight, you'll do other things during the night. So you'll maybe, depending on where you are, deploy side scan sonars or camera sludges, mud grabs, taking sediment samples. But all the time that you're doing it, every time you shoot the crawl away, you do a CTD conductivity, temperature density sensor. You do that all the time because I say one of the major roles of the ship is global warming. Tell us a bit about the boat itself. Well, it's a 69 metre vessel built 15 years ago. Has a crew capacity of 18, science capacity of 12. You have a wet lap for the wet fish work and mud work. You also carry four five containers which can be changed for multiple roles. One of the containers is connected to all the ship's system. Navigation, sonars, the acoustic containers and everything goes through that container. It's also connected to the ship's broadband so that the marine lab in Aberdeen can access the data from the shore. They can take water sampling through the bottom of the hull. You will deploy a thing we call Rosie, like a multi-sampling water sampling system that you send down through the water table down to three and a half thousand meters and then it goes down through the different water tables. It has 12 bottles on it and they will fire at different levels as they go down through the water. So they will collect the water as they go up and down through the water tables. They can analyze, all the water will be analyzed on board. Some will be taken ashore to be analyzed. She has a, a drop keel that once you sail, you get into open waters, that goes down three meters below the hull. So that when you're using the acoustic equipment, there's no surface noise from the uh, acoustics. It's also a diesel electric, so it's ultra quiet. There's no noise at all above the ship. And it's specifically designed like that for scientific operations. So there's no acoustic noise in the water. She also has active stability tanks because some of the oper science operations the tests that they're doing in the laboratories, they need a stable platform. So she rolls very little. She pitches sometimes in bad weather. But if you're at Rock Hole in 100 knot winds, you're gonna get a big spill. But she is a very, very stable seashell. The accommodation spread over four full decks of the ship. So there's plenty of room. How does life on board compare to the old commercial trawling days? Working wise, it's totally different. Because this isn't a commercial enterprise, everything is done with the health and safety in mind. We do risk assessments for everything that we do. And because I'm a deck boss, my role is making sure that nobody gets hurt on deck because the deck of a fishing vessel is a very dangerous place. But if you was in a commercial fishing vessel, you would find that 98% of them would be commercial fishermen with long time experience. But in the Scotia, what happens is we're short of people. So they're constantly getting people through agencies who are ABs, but they're not fishermen. And fishing is a total different job. Though you're not a scientist yourself, seeing what you see, talking to your colleagues and being involved to the level you are in these surveys, you must have a pretty good idea of some of the outcomes of the work done on board. So what are the general trends? As a commercial fisherman, I think that the cod are moving further north. But you see, starting to see other species that you didn't see a lot of at one time. John Dory's 
they're a lot more prevalent now than what they used to be. And as I said before, red mullet. They're starting to see now gilt-head bream, aren't they? Anglers, where they never used to see them. Well, they're a Mediterranean species. They are finding more mature haddocks on the west coast of Scotland. And I did say to one of the scientists, would the quarters be going up? And he said, no, they'll never go up. They'll stay the same. That is one of the things that we do the deep water species because they have such a long lifespan, they mature, they sexually mature when they're 15, 20 year old. So if they're being caught before that, that's a whole generation gone. There's a wonderful looking fish we get, it's called the blackfish. I'd love to catch one on a rod, but it's down at 1500 metres. But they just can't eat them, it's like a jelly, and they look wonderful, jet black they are. I've got a lot of the species on a stick somewhere. But I say, the mackerel, that was a surprise to them. They wanted to keep going further out into the Atlantic, but we had a couple of problems with that. One was coming to the end of the survey, and we needed to go back to Aberdeen, because the number of days that they do was set. Number two, we'd run out of charts. <laughs> number three, we'd run out of insurance for the ship. What about worrying trends or fish species coming under threat? No, the fish stocks are, are pretty healthy. We also do prawn stocks. The reason they had such an explosion of prawns in the North Sea was because the amount of fish that was being dumped, because you weren't allowed to catch it anymore. Now they're looking at this discard ban. But the thing is, with a discard ban, it's going to bring all sorts of problems, especially for smaller vessels. Where are they actually going to carry it? So if they're going to steam out 150 miles into the North Sea, save all the discards and then bring them back, what are you going to do with them? You can't put them in landfill. So they're going to have to go for fish meal, which will affect the fish meal prices. And it won't help fish stocks either by limiting or preventing discards. Undersized and outer quarter fish are still just as dead. Now, well, we do uh, gear technology, backless trolls, for the, uh, the prawn industry so that they can release. We do research into square mesh cut ends so the meshes don't close up so all the juvenile fish get away. But you also lose some marketable fish. But one of the biggest problems that I see as a commercial fisherman is seals. The number of seals that you see now. What's a seal eat a day? Half a hundred weight of fish? If you've got, I don't know, what is it, 50,000 seals now? England? How much fish a day are they eating? Probably more than what the fishermen are allowed to catch. The thing with wild animals is they are controlled by food. If there's no food, they just die out till there's more food. So if there's all these seals, what are they eating? On that reckoning then, there should be no shortage of fish. We don't have any problem catching fish. Scotia. And I'd say that the trolls that we use, the design is 40 year old. They're not commercial trolls. The only commercial troll we use are the monk trolls. Fishermen will always tell you, a big ship will always catch more than a little ship. It's just the way it is. You can use the same troll and troll alongside a ship that's bigger than you and he'll catch more. It's just the way it is. The ship sits more stable in the water, develops more thrust, you catch more fish. I always bring me bear home off the Scotia. I get plenty of fresh bear, mackerel, squid. I know the scientists have been saying there's more haddocks now on the west coast than what they've ever seen. The obvious final question has to be the future of marine environments and populations. From what you've seen and what the science is saying, what are the generally observed trends and what needs to be done to safeguard or even improve on what we currently have? Come out of the EC. The foreign fleet would collapse overnight. There's nowhere else for them to go. Where are the French, the Germans, the Dutch going to fish? This is how I look at it as a commercial fisherman. If the French are allowed 30,000 tonne of fish out of British waters, then a British fisherman should be allowed 30,000 tonne of fish out of French waters. It's a common resource, but they haven't got any fish. That's the reason they're all fishing around British waters and Irish waters. There is no fish for them. So in effect, if next week's Scottish independence referendum votes out, and, or if, Nigel Farage and UKIP get to hold the balance of power at the 2015 general election, either or both could see our fish stocks improve. Oh, it will. 
Malt can barely be empty. There's no local boats at the moment, is he? Yet you see all the big Dutchmen out there, soul fishing, Belgians and that. They're all out in Morgan Bay this time of year. They'll all be gone. This was a thing I could never understand. There was a Fleetwood skipper, Phil Dell. He wanted to work 100 millimetre cod ends so that he could just wriggle out a few of the smaller fish. But if he did that, he had to work 80 millimetre cod ends so he could get his 120 days. If he worked 100 millimetre cod ends, he only got 100 days. So to get rid of smaller fish, he lost 20 days work. But it should be the other way around. I know. And he offered to take the local MP out, fisheries advisors. They weren't interested. And this, I take it, is EU common fisheries policy regulation. Yeah, stupid. Because all the Dutchmen work at 80mm cut ends in Morecambe Bay because all the soles get out of the 100mm meshes. So, make it all 100mm or 120mm. If you go in Norwegian waters, you work 140mm cut ends. Square mesh panels. Separator grids. There's all sorts of methods that you can use. To sum things up then, despite all the complaints by anglers regarding catches, the real answer, it appears, would lie elsewhere. No, no, in fact, how many fishing boats are in Fleetwood now? Two, three. So in theory, you should be catching tons of fish. But we're not, as you yourself, also being a regular angler, will know only too well. We often see fluctuations with bad years and better years for some species. But generally speaking, and this is not me putting the rose-tinted glasses on here, there are not the numbers of fish about in shore these days, and more importantly, very few of the bigger fish either. And while fish numbers can be affected by many things including population shift through rising sea temperatures, lack of bigger fish suggests to me overcropping somewhere and by someone forcing the typical size of mature fish down, which taking on board your comments about less UK commercial boats means there's plenty for the crew of Scotia to be getting on with if the real answers are ever to be found. So many thanks then to Chris Borgie for his contribution here, and apologies once again for the electronic gremlins, which unfortunately crept in under the radar. <laughs> <laughs>